sempre é possível ser melhor no tratamento oncológico. Mais que um desafio pessoal, essa é a nossa realidade. Uma perspectiva revolucionária para a ciência, para os médicos e para os pacientes. Reframe Oncology. Revolucionar o futuro é nossa essência. Olá, amigos do Diagnóstico e Tratamento dos Tumores Musculoesqueléticos. Hoje, dia 14 de agosto, comemoramos o Dia do Oncologista Ortopédico. É um privilégio, como atual presidente da nossa associação, dar os parabéns e desejar sucesso a todos. Aproveito também para convidar todos os colegas ortopedistas, radiologistas, patologistas e oncologistas para a próxima edição do Congresso Brasileiro de Oncologia Ortopédica. Finalmente, após vários adiamentos, poderemos nos encontrar em Gramado, no Rio Grande do Sul, de 27 a 30 de abril, daqui a oito meses. O evento terá vários palestrantes renomados do Brasil e do exterior, apresentando novidades e discutindo casos no nosso tradicional modelo multidisciplinar. É também a melhor oportunidade dos diversos centros do Brasil apresentarem suas pesquisas e experiências. E claro, a tão esperada ocasião de abraçar os amigos depois de tanto isolamento. Vejo vocês em Gramado. Um forte abraço a todos. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Now, live, I'd like to celebrate and congratulate my colleagues for our day today. Today is the International Oncologist Day, and we have this new uh, live today of our program of continuous education. I'd like, first of all, to thank my colleagues here, you know, the speakers, our guests. Thank you for being here in the webinar. Dr. João Paulo Fonseca de Freitas coming from Portugal, Dr. Rodrigo Munoz coming from Sao Paulo, and Dr. Arne Streitburger from Essen, Germany. It's such a pleasure to have you here in our webinar. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Brincast, Baumer, Dashi Sekel, and also thank our uh, organizers, everybody, Acontece, the agency, Lucas, Ana, and this event is uh, transmitted by Orton TV. I'd like to thank the support of ABOO and SBOT, the Brazilian Societies and Associations of Orthopedic Oncology. So I'd like to give the floor to Ricardo Becker, Dr. Ricardo Becker. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Everybody that's here. Um, thank you to my colleagues that are here with us in this webinar. And like Dr. Edgar mentioned before, this event is being transmitted by Orcon TV online. We also have a open chat for questions. And these questions will be answered after each activity. And the speeches today will be around 20 to 30 minutes um, long with five minutes of discussion. We're going to start with Dr. my big friend, Dr. João Paulo Freitas coming from Coimbra, Portugal. He's a specialist in big orthopedic surgeries of high complexity. So Dr. João Paulo, if you're ready, you can go. Yes, good morning. I'm ready. I'm going to share my... Okay. So, hello to all of you. Uh, my name is João Paul Freitas and uh, I'm from Coimbra, Portugal. I'm really honored to be here with you all and to talk uh, uh, a part of my surgical life of the last years. And um, I'm, my talk uh, is not about my primary uh, surgical activity, the tumoral orthopedic surgery, but about other complex surgeries in the orthopedic field uh, using the silver coated megaprothesis in limb and salvage surgery. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask in Portuguese or in English, and so let's start. Okay, in uh, 
there are extreme orthopedic situations that put uh, at risk the viability of limbs. Uh, those are the, the case of the musculoskeletal tumors with great bone destruction, the trauma with severe bone loss with or without uh, infection, and the periprostatic osteolysis with large bone substance loss with or without infection. Uh, in these situations, the amputations appeared offered the, as the end result. Uh, and this is the outcome we want to avoid. We did a seven years retro retrospective study between July 2014 to, to July 2021. And we found 36 cases of limb salvage surgery in prosthetic complications of the lower limb. And all the patients were treated in the same hospital by the same surgeon. Uh, with the same surgical team and using the silver coated in the omega prothesis. Um, the patients uh, of our sample uh, uh, suffered from severe complications of primary or revisions, arthroplasty and knee, uh, the majority with um, the majority with infections and bone loss and complications of endomega prothesis like infection, osteolysis, mechanical failure and fractures. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. We use, uh, we follow different um, approach on the treatment on tumors, uh, trauma, and uh, infection case. I will not discuss them here uh, due to our time constraints, but I want to uh, to say we follow, and this is important to follow, uh, always uh, two-stage approach in the treatment of the infection cases. This is uh, the distribution uh, for the anatomical sites uh, about the megaprothesis, seven um, total femur prothesis, 11 uh, total prothesis of the knee with distal femur, proximal tibia, or both, and both means total knee and total knee with distal femur and proximal tibia, three knee arthrodesis prothesis, three sacrolumic lumic acetabular prothesis, and 13 total hip prothesis with proximal femur and omega prothesis. About the characteristics, our group of 36 patients, 15 uh, men, 21 women, uh, with an average age of 48 years old, an average of 22.3 centimeters of bone resected and the, their base pathology range from infection to massive osteolysis, complex fracture with bone loss and allograft fa uh, failure. We only have one case that demanded a second surgery for a reinfection. Our results are very encouraging so far. None of our patients showed any important manifestations of silver toxicity signs. We detected only two manifestations of cutaneous algeria in a proximal femur and in a proximal TV and megaprothesis. Only one case of reinfection in 36 patients. And regarding our functional results, uh, they were assessed uh, by the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society scale. And uh, the silver coated and omega prothesis are well tolerated by 29 of our patients, and only seven patients refer a satisfactory level of tolerability. In general, all our patients are satisfied with gra and grateful to be able to keep their lower limbs with quality um, of life, uh, allowing them to do the basic things in daily, their daily lives, uh, like walk, uh, driving an adapted car, uh, and the basic activities. Our outcome, and a good outcome, with low rates of complications and good functional results, uh, we think is due to a combination of, of uh, the factors like the surgical technique, the choice of the silver coat to the endomega prothesis, our treatment methodology, a careful reconstruction, and very important, the closure of the soft tissues. 
and it always uh, requires a very detailed and thorough planning of the surgeries as well as a very close follow-up of the patients if you we aspire to a sex, successful uh, outcome. In conclusion, we can say we, with our experience uh, that a careful and a thorough uh, surgical technique with the use of the silicone and the megaprothesis are ineffective surgical options in complex orthopedic clinical case with destruction or severe bone loss with or without infection, allowing the maintenance of a functional limb in situations where the amputation and even the articulation were before a solution. Now, the, I'm going to present you uh, several clinical cases from my practice where you can see everything we discussed before like the surgical planning, the surgical techniques, and finally, the, the final outcome. We began with this one, a female, 48 years old, uh, a car accident at 23 years old, uh, with a left femoral neck fracture and a total arthroplasty. Several, three revision surgeries. And um, in the last one, in 2011, she got infected with a periprosthetic infection. Uh, she, when I saw her, uh, she has a shortening of the left lower limb of four centimeters. And she was submitted to several sur cleaning surgeries, trying to save the lower limb and the prosthesis. And uh, after a while, the, she, she get the proposal to be amputated, to be amputated by the it's articulated by the she refused. And at that time I saw her and I proposed her to be submitted to a uh, two uh, stage uh, procedure to try to fight the, the infection, the periprosthetic infection. And currently five years with five years of follow-up, uh, she has a negative C-reactive protein and she walks with the, the help of one crutch. This is the X-ray, the pre-op, uh, where we can see a long stem from the revision uh, and uh, the bone loss in the proximal femur. We can see here a cage, a similar Bursch Schneider cage uh, with signs of loosening. This is the aspect of the surgical field after the first surgery when I, I perform a wide uh, debridement of all the devitalized soft tissues and the bone tissues, trying to get a blending surgical field to get there the defense of the body and the, the antibiotics used in the antibiotic therapy. That's the goal. And here we can see the acetabulum of the, the patient. And here, this is the osteolysis after the remove of the, the, the cage she had. This is the aspect of the spacer. I always uh, pro um, uh, I do the, the spacer uh, the, during the surgery, and I and the spacer is only for that is to get space to reconstruct in the second surgery. And in the second surgery, I I remove the spacer, uh, and um, and then. I performed the reconstruction with the uh, proximal femur and omega prothesis, and I use a double, mo a double mobility constraint uh, acetabulum. Always perform the, the, the functional trials, uh, trials during the surgery, seeing the good function and the stability of the reconstruction. And this is the X-ray pause up with the the um, proximal femur and omega prothesis and the reconstruction of the acetabulum. I used the uh, almonds, uh, Chantalio almonds, to reconstruct the acetabulum. And this is the patient's uh, five years of follow up, walking with the help of one crutches and free of any signs of infection until now. Another case, uh, a female too, with 45 years old, uh, with a pass with a, an aromastic cyst of the right femur, 
this is the information I I got from the the, the clinical process of the the patient. Um, she was submitted to a, a few revisions and. In the revision to nine, 2009, uh, with the molars ring, uh, she got an infection, a periprosthetic infection. And uh, after several surgeries, the same, she was proposed to, to be disarticulated by the hip. Uh, and this case has six years of follow up. And this is the x ray, the pre op with a long stem, uh, with uh, a huge uh, bone destruction in the shaft and the proximal femur. Another x-ray, and this is the aspect in the first surgery um, with the active fissiles with pus. And uh, I do the same, remove all the uh, devitalized soft tissues and devitalized bone tissues and perform a spacer. And in a, a second approach, after the antibiotic therapy and the analytical controls with the C uh, protein reactive uh, borderline in these patients, I performed the reconstructions with the um, a proximal femur endomega prothesis. And this is the patient walking at the three weeks after the second surgery. And she takes uh, antibiotics after the second surgery for a while too. And this is the patient three years after um, the second reconstruction. And like you see here, this is the cutaneous argyria in these patients, okay? And uh, now seven years, uh, six, six years after the, the limb salvage surgery, she's free from any signs of infection. This is the oldest one I have, um, a female 77 years old, uh, a plasmocytoma in 2008. And uh, it was one of my first ones. And I performed her um, endomega prothesis, a conventional uh, proximal femur endomega prothesis, uh, no silver coated. And um, after she got a breast cancer uh, in 2012, and uh, she got a, um, an infection of the implant of fix for the breast cancer chemotherapy. And she got an aseptic shock and, uh, and with that, an infection, a periprosthetic infection of the right hip and megaprothesis. Uh, in our hospital, we have a department to fight the infection. And uh, my colleagues here try to save the lower limb and the prothesis with several the uh, cleaning surgeries. And uh, at the time they said it's enough. Uh, and they proposed her to be amputated, to be desticulated by the hip. Uh, that at that time they asked me if I have something to offer to the patients. And uh, I proposed her for a two stage approach again. This is uh, the, uh, the conventional endomega prothesis at that time the pre-op of, uh, of the first surgery. And I removed the, always the same, the methodic, all the same steps and performed the uh, spacer. And this is uh, the, the image from the second surgery uh, where I remove the, the spacer and uh, I remove the rest of the residual femur there is no mechanical support and the quality of bone is very poor. And uh, I remove everything and I, re I did perform the reconstruction with a total femur and omega prothesis, silver coated. And this is the functional trials during the surgery. And this is the x-ray after the, the, sec the second surgery, the reconstructed surgery. And this is the patient walking at the three weeks after the, the surgery and here. Two months after the surgery. She is, this patient passed away two years ago because of her breast cancer. 
And at that time, three, three years after the second surgery, she was free from any signs of infection. And um, it was a, a very important case for me because one month and he, she will know she, she's gonna die and uh, she comes to me to say goodbye and to thank me to keep her lower limb. And um, it was a moment, I tell. Okay, another thing, uh, this is a youngest uh, woman um, with 22 years old at the time. Uh, I saw her, um, she has a pass of um, uh, an osteosarcoma of the left uh, proximal tibia. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, they, were, uh, they were submitted uh, to a reconstruction with a, a proximal tibia and omega prosthesis. Um, she, she got an, a, a periprosthetic infection uh, in, in September of 2018 with uh, uh, active fistulas, and uh, at that time uh, I proposed her to be treated in a two-stage um, approach. Uh, this is the pre, uh, the pre-op um, uh, X-ray. This is the aspect of the the patient in the first surgery with the active fistula. I always remove the 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 fistula, of course, and perform the wide rhythmant of all the devitalized soft tissues like you see here, all around the, the endomega prothesis. And uh, I remove the endomega prothesis and the devitalized bone. I perform then a spacer and the spacer um, uh, enabled to move the, the, the knee after the, this first surgeon, the surgery. And this is important to keep the movement of the knee to have a, um, a extensor apparatus enough to work after the, the reconstruction, uh, after the second surgery. Uh, this is the X-ray of the spacer and this patient is able to walk uh, after this first uh, uh, surgery uh, to go to the bathroom and to go to do basic things uh, uh, in the hospital. And the second surgery I performed uh, trying to keep the extensor apparatus always. And uh, I remove the spacer and I reconstruct with a total knee, a distal femur endomega prothesis and the proximal tibia endomega prothesis. And um, I reattach the extensor apparatus with the trevirate tube, tereftalat polyethylene, and um, reconstruct the, the extensor. This is the trials, the functional trials during the surgery, seeing the stability of the reconstruction. This, this is the, primi the primary fixation with the trevirate the, the tre tube. And um, this is the x-ray after the, the reconstruction. And this is the patient walking uh, four months after the second reconstruction. Now, three years after the reconstruction, she's free of any signs of infection. And she's going married. <laughs> um, another, another case of a proximal tibia, a young man with 22 years old. He has a problem with uh, skin coverage, with exposure of the silver coated prothesis, and I submitted her, him uh, for a two stage uh, approach to treat the, the situation. I remove everything uh, the same. Uh, here, um, this is the, the removal of the trivial tube uh, he had, and it's not easy to remove the trivial tube uh, with all the fiber optic tissue. Uh, in the trivia tube. The, that's the property who allows the trivia tube to do a second fixation uh, of the structures. And uh, I always use a uh, lavage, a pulsatile lavage with betadine and uh, peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide. 
And uh, this is the image from the second, uh, from the, um, the spacer in the first surgery and the X-ray after the, the first surgery. And then I performed the, the second uh, surgery, the reconstruction with the removal of the spacer, always the same. A particularity in this patient, like you can see here, he hasn't um, no patellar tendon. And I reconstruct the patellar tendon using the trevirate tube. I reattach the trevirate tube on the trevirate tube surrounding all the, in the, the proximal tibia and omega prothesis, like you can see here. And um, I, here in this surgery, I have the support of this, the plastic surgery uh, using a free flap, a musculocutaneous free flap to cover uh, the end omega prothesis. I usually use, and it's me who perform that. I usually use the medial gastrocnemius to cover the proximal tibia end omega prothesis. It's easy for, for us, for the orthopedic surgeons to do that. This is the x-ray after the second uh, surgery. And this is the patient uh, walking two months and a half after the second surgery. And uh, this case has three years and until now, no signs of infection. This is a trauma, um, a trauma situation, a multifragment superintercondylian fracture of the left distal femur. And this patient has a special condition at the time uh, they come to me, he come to, uh, came to me. Um, he had a supercondylar fracture uh, of the distal left femur at uh, 17 years old. And he had a deformed femur, deformed bone. So uh, when he did this fracture, he stays in his hospital uh, for long and get uh, an infection in the, in the fracture. And they propose him to be amputated by the tie. Uh, he refused and they asked my hospital if there is, if there was some help to, to this patient and they sent the patient to me and I performed the same. I remove all the fracture fragments and uh, a wide bridgment and uh, a pulsatile lava with the same, perform the spacer. This is the x-ray of the spacer, this patient uh, was able to walk uh, after the first uh, surg surgery to go to the bathroom too and to walk in the hospital. And I performed the second surgery after the antibiotic therapy and the analytical controls. The same, remove the, the spacer and uh, reconstruct with the distal femur endomega prothesis, uh, silver coated. And um, this is the patient uh, three weeks after the surgery, the second surgery. And this is the X-ray of the reconstruction. And this is the patient now. Um, he's able to walk without crutches. Uh, he has already some uh, li physical limitations um, because of uh, the accident at 17 years old, but uh, he recovered um, the, uh, the possibility and the, the, he's able to walk without any external support. Um, this is the, the biggest one I have. Uh, and this is a periprosthetic infection, a male with 65 years old. With um, uh, he, he got uh, an hip heart opacity of the right hip when he was 25 years old because maybe in a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. Uh, he was admitted to a three revision surgery outside of our country. And in that surgery, they apply um, allograph, bone allograph uh, in to reconstruct the acetabulum. He did a uh, paraprostatic femoral fracture uh, at 45 years old. And when um, 
the colleagues did the osteosynthesis of this periprosthetic fracture. Uh, he got a, a periprosthetic infection. Uh, a polymicrobial, uh, with polymicrobial cultures. Uh, and um, after several surgeries trying to save the lower limb, uh, he get the, the indication to be amputated, to be disarticulated by the hip. But here, um, a special attention for one thing, he had at that time, bone holograph incorporated in the right acetabulum. If someone performed the uh, disarticulation by the hip, it's very hard to, to fight an infection with that bone inside the body. So it's, uh, it must, re it's, it's necessary uh, to have the idea to remove that, that bone. But um, the patient refused to be disarticulated. And um, when I saw uh, him, he has at that time set seven centimeters of shortening of the right limb. And I prepared this patient for a while uh, for the heart treatment. Um, I could uh, offer him and I proposed him for a two stage, the same uh, uh, treatment in two stage approach. And I propose him to be submitted to a right hemipelvectomy and the rim, the excision of the proximal two thirds of the femur. And then I will reconstruct him with a, um, a sacrolomic and a, a total femur uh, endomega prothesis. This is the x ray pre op of the first surgery. Uh, you can see here. Uh, the cage and the huge uh, amount of destruction of bone and with the plate uh, just close to the knee. This is the aspect of the, the patient in the first surgery, the landmarks to perform the surgery. I removed the fistulas, the wide arrangement of all the soft tissues and the, the prosthetic material and the osteosynthesis material. This is the surgical field cleaned uh, and this is the material removed. I performed the spacer and uh, I, with, uh, with the German team of implant cast, I planned the, the reconstruction of the patient. Uh, this is the image, uh, the 3D image uh, of the CT scan with the spacer of the patients. And this is the, the reconstruction after several discussions uh, between me and the German team with the sacrolumic and uh, uh, total femur endomega prothesis. And uh, this is image from the second surgery where I remove the spacer and the residual uh, bone, the femoral bone uh, with the, I, I'm trying to show there the whole of the screws of the, the plate uh, um, I removed in the first surgery. This is the aspect of the surgical field after the sacrolumic and the plate in the tibia and now with the lumic and the total femur endomega prothesis. This is uh, an image of the reconstruction. And this is the functional trials during the surgery, seeing the good function of the reconstruction, the stability. And this is the x-ray after the surgery. This is uh, image, 3D image of the CT scan of the, the, re, the endomega prothesis of the reconstruction with the custom made and uh, the total femur the topogram of the CT scan. Uh, we can see here the shortening, but already the shortening exists before the first surgery. And this is the patient walking two months after the second surgery. And uh, on the last case, I want to show you uh, only to see the, uh, the fibrotic uh, uh, growth, the the growthing of the fibrotic tissues in the terrier tube. This is a, a conventional endomega prothesis, uh, no silver coated, and with a periprosthetic infection. 
with several active fistulas, and this patient was proposed to be disarticulated by the hip too. And uh, I performed the, the wide bridgement, and here we can say this is the trabeular tube. Uh, it's like fibrotic tissues, and that's uh, the, the what allows to uh, reinsert the the muscular tendon uh, structures and to work the the stensor apparatus and the other uh, muscular tendinous structures. And this is an histological image from that tissue I removed with the microtubes of the trevary tube that the, the, the polytonic trephthalat surround uh, with the fibrotic tissue. And uh, the same, I performed in this patient a spacer, I removed the spacer and I reconstruct with a total femur and omega prothesis and uh, this is the x-ray after the reconstruction. And this is the patient walking close the other one, the patient uh, submitted to the sacrolumic. And um, this is my presentation I have to, I have two more cases, but uh, it's, uh, my, I know my presentation is very big. This is my town, uh, Coimbra. I thank your, your attention to me. And uh, this is my hospital. And thank you. Thank you all. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, um, in Portuguese, in English, whatever, I'm here for you. And thank you for your attention. Muito obrigado, João Paulo. Muito obrigado. Não sei se você está escutando. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. João Paulo. Thank you for your excellent cases. Oh my God! Actually, I uh, I feel like asking you 50 questions, but I'd like to ask Dr. Edgar. Dr. Edgar, do you have any questions coming from the chat? Anything there? We don't have any questions yet in the chat. So, Edgar, do you have any questions? And you can ask a question. <laughs> Jean Paul, I'd like to know. I saw that in average it take about eight weeks to do the second time of your revision surgery, in at least in two cases that were described here. What do you use? What is determinant for you to what are the parameters to determine? that now is the moment for the second time of the surgery. What are the parameters that you use? Um, Ricardo, I always follow the clinical uh, evolution of the patients, of course, but uh, I follow the um, analytical uh, control with the C-reactive protein. And when I have, um, borderline parameters or negative C-reactive protein is time to go forward. And um, usually I use eight weeks of uh, antibiotic therapy and I do a tree therapy with metronidazole, uh, an antistaphylococcic antibiotic like uh, vancomycin or tacoplanin or linezolid or daptomycin. And to cover the gram negatives, I use the metoplasm. Usually with these, I get good uh, um, uh, control results uh, um, from the analytical parameters. Uh, parameters. Uh, but uh, the, um, it's not easy to, to say, okay, this is the time, but this is what I usually follow the C-reactive protein, borderline or negative, and the clinical aspect in the patients. Yes. Você coleta algum, algum fluido, alguma secreção? Do you collect any secretion, any liquid, any fluid by potion to determine the revision, I mean, the infection, to see if the infection is off? Or what do you do? Um, do you collect no. any fluid? Uh, 
No, I don't do that. I know that there is some uh, some colleagues who do that. I don't do. Uh, we know the spacer is only there to have space for the reconstruction. It's not to fight infection. And it could be in, uh, the fluid, uh, it could be positive for cultures. And, but to that. I follow the analytical, uh, the serological, uh, analytical parameters to to get the ideal time to go forward for the second surgery, uh, Ricard. I don't collect. I usually collect a lot, a lot. Um, usually 10, uh, 12, um, uh, in different sides of the surgical field uh, to, to check if there is any kind of uh, uh, positive culture there. And in, in this uh, world, and I have seven years of this, I, I get the, the experience, not all the, the bacteria can be uh, cultivated and some of them, uh, they only say like the, one of my last ones, anaerobic, gram negatives, but then they don't know who, who, what kind of species is there. Uh, we only know the most aggressive, the most virulent of the bacteria like the Staphylococcus aureus, um, but that's the procedure I take. During the surgery, I collect always in the first and the, in the second surgery, a lot of uh, um, uh, samples of the wicket uh, to check if uh, I can get some positive cultures. And I have, and I have another question. I'm going to ask you in English now. So you have, uh, you, are you, 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 you told us that you have, you had three meshes, three attachment tubes in your cases. You know, it's ten percent of the cases. Three meshes, three attachment tubes, tubes to trivia tubes. Uh, so, I, I ask you about the the risk of reinfection if if they're using this <laughs> kind of mesh. I am a little bit afraid of using it. I don't know uh, what. Do you <laughs> One of the properties of the polyethylene of terephthalate is the low rate of infection. That's one, and. Uh, when the, the terephthalate, the polyethylene terephthalate, the trivira tube or the trivira appears in the 60s and it, it was in the, in the fashion uh, in, the, in the fashion industry uh, to do clothes and other things. But one of the properties of the, the polyethylene terephthalate is the low rate of infection. Of course, is a high risk, is one more the synthetic uh, thing put inside the patient. But in the second uh, reconstruction, you, you feel, okay, I have done everything to save the lower limb and to get a better functional outcome. And if you trust in the treatment and you have a clean surgical field, I don't have afraid to use the Trevor tube to when is important to get better outcome, uh, better functional outcome in the patients, like in the reconstruction of the extensor apparatus, of course, I use. Amazing, thank and, you. Thank and you I don't have a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> thank but, you, uh, thank you very much. I have um, so many questions to ask you, but I'll ask you privately later, okay? Okay, Ricardo. <laughs> after, after your vacation, after your vacation, so uh -huh. I know that you're leaving. <laughs> You're always free to ask me and to talk with me, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jean Paul. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I'll just you're turn welcome. to Portuguese now. Okay. Uh, bom, pessoal, é, agradeço muito well, aos colegas, ao, ao Dr. João Paulo. I'd like to thank Dr. João Paulo, and I'd like to continue. Edgar, do we have any questions there in the chat? Let's continue with the presentations, please. So I'd like to call Dr. Rodrigo Munoz. Dr. Rodrigo Munoz is an orthopedic oncologist 
of uh, Hospital Sierra Libanese in Sao Paulo. He's going to talk about tenosynovial giant cells tumor and the future perspectives of that. So Dr. Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here in this webinar. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here in this uh, great webinar, especially because this is a little bit different than what I do every day. It's a different thing for us to do, right? Just being a webinar. So thank you for being here. Well, I'm going to speak a little bit over 15 minutes about the future perspectives of the systemic treatment of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. I am a clinical oncologist. I work with sarcomas and cutaneous uh, tumors. I work in the Institute of Cancer in Sao Paulo and also Hospital Syrian Libanese. These are my potential disclosures and current positions. And before I actually go to the uh, systemic treatment of the disease, Let's uh, talk about the tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Let's call it TGCT. It's rare, no malignant neoplasms involving the synovium of joints, bursae, and tendon sheets. And it's actually benign. However, often it can be locally aggressive. And there are rare, rare cases uh, that, that happens. That usually it's typically present in young and middle-aged adults. Um, 1.8 cases per million of inhabitants. And then the names is a little bit, it's a little bit difficult, you know, that name. It's basically giant cell tumor of tendo sheath, which is localized TGCT. And, and then we did nodular tenosynovitis. And then we have the diffuse TGCT, diffuse type GCT or pigmented villonodular synovitis. So these are the nomenclatures. And then as image goes, this is a lesion and it's it's very good uh, radiographically, but poorly defined periarticular masses. We have the gen degenerative joint disease, cystic lesions in the adjust adjacent bone and the MRI Decreased sinu intensity in T1 and T2 weighted sequences in the pathology. We saw proliferation of mononuclear cells, mixed osteoclasts like giant cells, foamy histiocytes, inflammatory cells, collagenous uh, background, and then the nodular form. Like I said, we see low grade, and the diffuse has uh, mitotic countage more, about five mitosis per millimeter. The numbers nowadays have, of course, we bring from other countries. We don't know the incidence in Brazil, but according to the North American casuistic, the tumor is localized and it's more than 90% of TGCT cases with uh, almost 15,000 new cases per year. It's usually nodular, favorable course, low recurrence rates, less than 10%. And frequently it's manifested in the extremities. These correct characteristics contrast with the diffuse TGCT, which is about 10% of the others, which so only 1,500 new cases in the United States, but typically affecting younger patients, female and male, but more females than males actually, large joints, knees, ankles, hips, and it has an unfavorable course. It's a lot of uh, uh, difficulties there, high recurrence rate after the first surgery, it's more than 50%. Rare cases of metastatic disease uh, described in the literature, but we understand that, that uh, it's a disorder that offers local and aggressive local complications than a potential metastatic potential. Of course it happens, but still it's rare. Here we have some examples completely different than the localized. Localized is totally different than diffuse. The radiological aspect shows the biggest aggressive aggressivity. And that's the focus of our discussion about the systemic treatments. Well, TGCT symptoms include pain, using analgesic and opioids, use is common, swelling, stiffness, joint stability, hematrosis, decreased range of motion, ROM, 
disability and functional impairments and impairment of the quality of life. So we have this TGZT in their daily routines. And when we see this retrospective, we see that there is a, a functional uh, impairment for daily activities, pain, and translating that into anxiety, depression, and so on. And people also don't work very well. So there is the laboral, laboral capabilities are reduced more than 1300 patients with TGCT and controls that we see that there's a big proportion of people going to ERs, to hospitals, using medication, reinforcing the impact of, yeah, of a functional use of hospitals and also an economic impact affecting a population that uh, war are working and so on. So it, the therapeutic approaches, it's key to say that even though the, the, gold, uh, the golden uh, pattern of surgery is of course the optimal surgical resection, arthroscopic versus open. And there are studies that say that they reduce pain, improve functionality, minimize the risk of recurrence, for open, but of course, these two possibilities are there. And of course, the goal of reducing pain, improving functionality, and so on. For the diffuse form, of course, the recidive, the recurrence is very probable, risk of post op uh, hematrosis, stiffness. So the substitution of uh, we have total synovectomy, joint replacement, amputation even. Other strategies that were used in the past include cryotherapy, radiosynovectomy, which is an injection, an articular injection of an oncoloid of, of uh, 90, and uh, external radiotherapy in doses from 30 to 36 GI, but in this meta-analysis published in 2015, including 630 uh, patients' data, there was a potential role in the perioperative setting with duration 0.31, but low level of evidence. Typically, we save the radiotherapy for patients in which a surgery is not uh, appropriate especially for patients in the diffuse form. It's important to see that even when the treatment, the surgical treatment is good, the diffuse have risk of post-operational -opera hematrosis, stiffness and instability, and the recurrence rate is 15 to 50%. So the patient journey in TGCT is very long because there are many interventions that they will have and evaluation by different professionals, which is tiring. So <coughs> surgical orthopedics, specialists in, in sports medicine, oncologists, and so on, surgeons, and so on. Sorry. So especially with the systemic agents, uh, it's important to have a clinical oncologist. Until 2019, we didn't have any approved therapies we had some activities of uh, MITNB, and I will come, go back to that. But after 2019, we had novelties, carcinogenesis and molecular insights. This is interesting because this disorder is clonal. It's a neoplastic process marked by T12, putting in aggregate CSF1 co 683 and the result is an overexpression of CSF1 macrophage and CSFR and this superexpression of CSFR it takes this this overpression will take it to reactive um, inflammatory process all right so there's a recruitment of CSF1R expressing cells but this is part of this tumor. The biggest part of this tumor is this inflammatory component that installs there because of the recruitment of those cells. And this was basis of the approach of the, 
there was a phase one study with Pexidartinib in the journal medicine in 2015, the drug, the PLX3397, or Pexidartinib, it's a small molecule TK inhibitor, highly selective for the receptor CS1. And all we see here is the ability of inhibition of CSF1R because it selects different agents. And then when you compare to the other uh, dro drug with imatinib, we see a concentration for the inhibition of CSF1R. So imatinib is a strategy, but paxidartinib is better. We saw a response very good with 20 available or evaluated patients. We saw a response tax of 60% with many responses that were very sustainable, prolonging for more than 20 months. We have here some patients with pexidartinib uh, in phase one, and it goes beyond what we could measure because there is a, re a volumetric reduction, very good. So we did a phase three study that was done a phase three study so the Pexidartinib was approved by the FDA uh, North American, and it was uh, published at Lancet in 2019. 39 international centers participated, adult patients with um, TGCT symptomatics, known candidates to surgery, and they had their disease, which was me measurable. And the study had two parts a blind, randomized uh, part one, and the part two was open label extension with cross uh, over of patients. So the, pla the placebo ones could go to pexidartinib. So the first part, placebo controlled and blinded, and then we had pexidartinib 1000 for 22 weeks, 1 million, uh, 1000 mg per day, reduced to 800 mg per day. And after the third week, we had the, we did the crossover in that um, arm of pexidartinib. So we had 91 uh, patients treated with pexidartinib. They were stratified according, it was United States versus no United States and TGCT in, in uh, upper limbs versus lower limbs. So we are looking for the response level after 25 weeks using uh, criteria based in images. And then the secondary uh, were, were good information with functional aspects, um, amplitude of movements, stiff, articular stiffness, response, bad responses, and a different way of evaluating, which was a tumor volume score. I'm going to show you the tumor volume score, TVS. This is very important for TGCT because no, resist, we measure the biggest lesion. So we have that goal uh, lesion. And then measuring this the tumor, tumor volume, of course, it, it, it's hard work to do radiologists, but the variability is better but it's capture all the tumor, so it's good. So then you can reduce that mass, that amorph mass, right? So the population was very representative in the casuistic. We had an age, a median age of 44, so 18 to 79 years old for placebo, and Pax 13, 22 to 75. So male, female, knee, or, uh, or ankle. What we saw here, five minutes. Oh, sorry. So we saw a response tax of 40% with pexidartinib with 0% with placebo. So which was really significant. We have a patient that was treated with pexidartinib with a very morbid a lesion demanding amputation and the response was really good after three years with a reduction, a very good reduction of the tumor. 
About the secondary endpoints, we saw a very uh, good response for functionality, pain, and so on. And then a superior response, which was captured by Resisti when we saw the TVS, tumor volume score. So the response was 55.7% versus 0% of placebo. More recently, we, there was a uh, pooled analysis, you know, combined analysis, phase one in the randomized uh, study and the part two with the patients that did crossover, the randomized with placebo, 130 patients with a median age, a median duration of exposure, 18.7 months. And we saw a response text that was very objective, 65% by the TVS, with a median uh, uh, response uh, around three months. So the responses were very early, very precautious. So we have some peculiarities of pexidartinib and all the patients that were treated, they of course had some adverse effect, uh, three or superior 33% up to 50% and Toxicity uh, levels that were up to 20% in the cohorts after the, 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 the standard pattern of pexidartinib dose was established. And it, it got to 33% of discontinuation of, uh, because of toxicity. Well, what are the toxicities? So we have hair color changes, nausea, fatigue, uh, AST increase, AOT increase, and arthralgia. So uh, usually ANT is elevated. The pexidartinib has hepatotoxicity. So two clinically distinct types of hepatic adverse reaction, aminos, um, aminotransferase elevations and mixed or cholestatic hepatotoxicity. hepatotoxicity. They are reversible. Uh, with other doses, especially during the first two days, there is a standard, it's a co static pattern, which you have an increase in alkaline phosphatase with or without amino transferase elevations. And it's uncommon and idiosyncratic, but it can last longer, maybe prolonged and irreversible can be, it's rarely serious but it can be very, very severe and threatening. So in August of 2019, pexidartinib was approved by the FDA for TGCT. There were no candidates for surgery, 400 milligrams twice daily on an empty stomach, at least one hour before or two hours after a meal. There is a pact that uh, it's important that, so there are some alternative schemes, so you can reduce the intake of fat in Brazil. The process is in, the, the registration is pending by Anvisa, so we're still waiting. Uh, Pexidartinib is not the only drug. We also have the Emactuzumab, RG7155, recombinant, humanized monoclonal, IgG1 antibody against the CSF1R, resulting in the dimerization domain to block ligand-induced receptor activation that depends on receptor homodimerization. We saw a text of response, which was very impressive, 83%, and some very pronounced responses, reducing over 80%. We have some patients here with emactuzumab with dramatic responses and the phase one study, which was published in the end of 2020, 63 patients, 71% was the response, significant functional improvement, and the tolerance was a little bit distant, different than we had edema, prurus, asthenia, and no depth. There is another one called Cabiralizumab, phase one and phase two studies with very early data still, but reinforcing that the efficacy of the CSF1 with a mononuclonal uh, antibody 
And then the cohorts had very important responses and the tolerance pro profile is a little bit different too. The same way, uh, purity, edema, and then CPK elevation. There is a bigger le level of CP CPK in this people. Imatinib too. We had imatinib before prexidatinib, and this is a retrospective series in 2019, including 62 patients, four individuals with metastatic disease, 71% with recurrent disease. These patients had a seven month treatment. Four patients had metastatic disease. They had a fast progression and they were, they were excluded of the analysis, resulting in 58 patients evaluated with no metastatic disease. And then we saw a response of 31% and a symptomatic benefits, 108% uh, and 48% with no progression in five years, having good control of diseases after the discontinuing with uh, imatinib. So we're talking about a very rare clonal neoplastic disease that affects young and functional patients characterized by bicellular proliferation affecting the synovial tissue. The incidence in Brazil is still unknown. So the patients for surgery, surgery is the pattern, the standard for treatment, but we understand, we know that the diffuse uh, is good. And in this entity, there is a rational molecular and mechanism for blocking of the receptor of CSF1 and this compelling clinical evidence supporting the use of pexidartinib. So we can use pexidartinib, imatinib, or uh, monoclonal anticorps like emactuzumab for patients that are non-candidates of surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. And I'd like to speak about the Brazilian Orthopedic Oncology Congress in Gramado from 27th to 30th of April. This is my email address and I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. This um, subject is very relevant, is very important because the orthopedicians have been suffering for decades because of the old Sinovigi and now it's TGCT. We don't have any systemic treatment, any support. So this was really good. We received this type of drug in this uh, therapeutic. So it's good to receive that. We're very um, excited to receive that we know that it's hard to, these studies are hard, right? Especially with the Pexidatinib. I don't know if there are some questions, but I don't know, Edgar, any questions from the audience? Not yet, they usually come later after the presentations. All right, so let's see. You spoke about all the drugs of all the medication and pexidartinib is actually closer to, I mean, we have imatinib, of course, and the results were inferior, but do you have any news, any good news from the backstage? Ricardo, I don't know about tying, you know, but it's actually um, working out. I mean, Anvisa is actually, Anvisa is asking for many documents, you know, there's a bureaucracy, but I don't have any, any dates or any con confirmed dates. So we still depend on that for TC, um, TGCT, we still depend on imports. And of course you can use off-label uh, situation. Ematozunab, is it available for that? Ricardo, According to my knowledge, we don't have any, any uh, knowledge of dematozumab for any entities. So when we have anything viable, because the cases are dramatic, right? That would be really interesting, even for some new adjuvants or something to reduce, because you showed the case in the beginning, which was really uh, scary, right? I mean, it's dramatic. 
So in cases like that, you know, the patient suffers so much, then it's horrible, right? So, Rodrigo, um, I think it would be nice for us to have a Congress of only on TGCT, right? It would be great because some people are very interested in doing that and doing some webinar. We really need, we need the data. We need to, to really have all these data of Brazil. And I think a collab study multi-centered would be excellent at this moment. Ricardo, uh, Rodrigo, we have a question coming from the audience, but I'd like to make a comment. That would be very interesting. We have our national statistics because classically, we have uh, higher volumes that would have more indication for systemic treatment. Mauricio Tiberi is asking if you know any study of using these drugs in the case of some adjuvant for surgery. I mean, trying to you know, diminish the, the symptoms after surgery. Dr. Edgar, not yet uh, in oncology, we actually use these drugs for more advanced uh, cases. And then the natural path is that the development will go for petty um, operative, like Ricardo showed. The candidates for these treatments are patients that are not eligible for um, surgery. You know, that's the, the current scenario. But I think in the next future, in the near future, we, go, we will have studies and data for that, just like we had for other tumors, right? Perfect. Antonio Marcelo is asking if you think that after Anvisa, uh, do you think that after Anvisa opens that for this drug, but do you think the Brazilian public health system will be uh, open for that too? Will be delivering these drugs? Well, it's very bad, the situation of the Brazilian health uh, system here, because the treatment for melanoma, even though the paradigms changed after the uh, 2014, but the treatment is always chemotherapy. And we have a hiatus of what we need and what is offered by the uh, public system, health system in Brazil. So a drug for this entity that's very rare, so it's hard, you know, and the mortality is very high. So we still need that. And I think it's hard to have that provided by SUS, the Brazilian health system, public health system. Becker, we have many compliments from the audience, but uh, well, thank you so much. Thanks, it was a pleasure to participate. Thank you very much. Your class was like unbelievable, thanks. So let's continue with our presentations. And I'd like to call to the floor, Professor Arne Streitburger from Essen, Germany. He will be speaking about the endoprosthetic reconstruction of bone defects after tumor resection around the knee. So Professor Arne, the floor is yours. So, yeah. Um, just let me share my my screen. Okay, so there we are. So thanks for the introduction. So it's um, it's, it's a pretty rare um, entities at least that that are um, around the knee joint. So what we do is um, what I like to do with, with all of you is to share some of my experiences in dealing with these patients in surgical oncology. So we know that. Um, we deal with different types of tumors um, around the knee joint. So we did see in the last presentation some um, bone tumors. So primarily we deal with bone tumors such as the osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and the very young ones. But then again, in the older ones, we deal of course with metastatic disease, just like this renal cell carcinoma and the distal femur. Um, we deal with lymphoma, um, and also with soft tissue, some soft tissue sarcoma, which are pretty rare, but some of these encasing the total bone and there's no 
chance to to get a good surgical or concurrent margins margins um, while not resecting part of the bone and it, like, just like in this case this is the femur and then you have to replace it using some tumor and a prosthesis then uh, of course there are even more rare tumors just like this um, benign a bone tumor, the giant cell tumor with a total destruction of the distal part of the femur. So there's no chance for curatage and filling or using denusumab in this case. Um, there you need to do something about the, the destructive bone and there's an indication also for using tumor and a prosthesis. So um, the conditions we face in tumor surgery and surgical oncology are totally different in comparison to primary arthroplasty. So we deal with very, very large bone defects. So an average is around about 18 centimeters for the proximal tibia and also for the distal femur. If you look at into literature, and this is what our, um, our data suggests. So um, sometimes it's more, but, um, and sometimes it's less, but an average is around about 18 centimeters, which is a huge um, distance to reconstruct. Um, then of course we have um, the loss of functional musculature. So what we need is to provide a good function for the patient after surgery is enough musculature. And if you look at these papers, uh, these um, slides there, these images, you're gonna see that there, sometimes we deal with tumors with a huge extension into the soft tissues. And there you can imagine if you want to get good margins, you need to sacrifice a lot of um, the surrounding musculature to get clear margins in terms of oncolo oncological safe margins. Um, we have absolutely, and this is absolutely different to normal arthroplasty, we deal mostly with oncological patients. So they receive additional radiotherapy locally, for example, in urine sarcomas, where we did it, do it most oftenly. And of course, um, you deal with patients that are treated with systemic chemotherapy. And these are both factors which influence um, our our results in terms of function and, but also in complications negatively, and which are the most important factors in, in terms of wanting delays, wanting complications and infections. So other preconditions are we deal with patients of every age group. So we start with a very young one. So around about five years of age, I think this is a good age to, to, to think about using anaprosthetic replacements. Um, but, and also we deal with very old ones, which are sick, which have comorbidities, and they are not doing that good as in primary arthroplasty, so at least most of them. We have in the very young ones, very small anatomy, just like in this case, you're gonna see, this is just round about a layer of, of soft tissues of 1.3 centimeters around the bone, around the tumor. You can imagine if you use normal conventional implants with these huge volumes, then it's very difficult to reconstruct the, um, the bone defect, but also to cover the implant, which is, decisive for a good function and, um, and reducing the complication rates. And they need to be la last long. So if you treat a patient with the age of six, 10, 12, even 20 years, um, around about eight, 70 to 80% survive their disease. And then they, the, the implant needs to last centuries or at least decades. And this is something that, um, that we have to keep in mind if we deal with these patients. So just some examples um, for, for a distal femur replacement. We already saw this image. It's a late uh, solitary metastasis of a renal cell carcinoma in a 75-year-old patient. Um, so in these cases, we tend to do um, a wide resection because um, there are several studies showing that they, they might profit in terms of overall survival if you do a resection in the late metastasis in this disease. So after biopsy, and which confirmed the, the, um, the histology, we did a wide resection and put in this tumor endoprosthesis. And as you can see, um, I tend to use in around about 85 to 90%, I'm gonna use cementless stem fixation because I think this is more easy. It saves some, spend, saves some time during surgery, um, but also in case of revision, it's more easy to handle if there is, um, in a non-cemented stem in comparison to a cemented stem. Um, and the results I'm gonna show you later are, are pretty good also. So if you, second case, it's a Ewing sarcoma, which is becoming a, bit, a little bit more difficult. This is a pathological fracture. You can see this um, MRI there um, with a huge um, soft tissue expansion. It's contaminated hematoma, and we need to do something about that. So this patient received pre of neoadjuvant neo um, treatment. We put him in a plaster and good luck had a good response. So the, there was a huge tumor shrinking 
during neoadjuvant chemotherapy and um, so some, some consolidation of the bone. He was doing fine, so we didn't do any fixation. We just put him in a plaster and he did so well during the, the first courses of chemotherapy. And this was something we decided then to try to salvage his leg. Um, we need to sacrifice the knee joint because there was a huge tumor expansion distally, but we were able to save the hip joint and the patient was doing fine. But obviously this, these patients need neo or at, at least they need um, chemotherapy, but they also need local radiotherapy to control the tumor and at least the local recurrence. And, but this worsens, of course, our results. However, results on dystophema are not too bad. So um, for us Germans, we have still have some, some good winters and have snow in the winter time, um, despite global warming. And um, so the patients need to do some sports and in winter times, I like to do some skiing. Um, obviously it's not that all patients do that good like this patient, but um, I, I always like to present this um, video um, because some of them are doing quite good. So um, come to the proximal part of the uh, tibia, to the proximal tibia tumors. So this is a bit more difficult. So this is a femoral replacement. Mostly you have some good soft tissue coverage. In the proximal part of the tibia, you just can feel your chin bone. There's nothing on top of it, just uh, skin and some subcutaneous fat tissue. So it's more easy to, to cover these implants. And this is an example of a 13-year-old girl with a teleangiectatic osteosarcoma. Um, she had a contraction of the knee joint, so I didn't get a better imaging. Um, however, she received knee to vent treatment. She responded well to treatment, and then we decided to um, resect the bone and, and reconstruct it with this tumor and a prosthesis, and again, with a non-cemented technique. So what these patients, what makes it a bit more difficult is that you need to cover the implant, particularly ventrally, um, because otherwise you won't get an, an infection in, in close to 100% of these patients. Um, we tend to use um, the gastroflap in these cases also. We just saw it with uh, um, Dr. Freitas presented um, some of his cases. Um, it's very much the same technique. So I can come, go through this um, a little bit faster. So you have to reattach the extensor mechanism and the patella ligament on top of the implant. And we use either one trivial tube, or I tend, in the last couple of years, I tend to use some resorbable mesh, which works quite nicely also. And then you need, um, you get a good biomechanical link between the implant and the extensor mechanism to get some active extension left. Um, and then you just cover the implant with the gastro flap, um, you close the wound, and then you. Um, close the skin. And this is just one example of, of a young woman. She's doing quite fine. And most of the results present, at least my experience is that most of the patients get some good um, function results and, and an active range of, um, of, of extension in the knee joint um, with uh, not that much deficiencies. So another thing is where, where it's getting even more complicated is intraarticular tumors. So some of these, and these are very rare cases, just around about, I would say, one to five percent of these distal um, femur tumors, which have an involvement of the knee joint. And when there is obviously tumor within the knee joint capsule, you need to make the decision whether you do an amputation um, in these cases, or you try to get the tumor out, including the knee joint, to keep it closed where, during the surgery, and then do a reconstruction of the knee joint. Um, th this is something, a technique we did in some cases um, in the past. Um, so you need to halven, at least more than half the extensor mechanism. You even lose more musculature than a normal dystophema replacement. You leave the joint closed during surgery, and then you halven the patella tendon. And then in most of the cases, you're able to um, remove the distal part of the femur. You, you cut somewhere in the tibia and remove the proximal part of the fibula and leave the joint closed. So you have a good margin for, for the tumor resection. However, this works out as a surgical, as, uh, as a surgical technique, not too bad. Although we just looked at some of our patients that we treated some years ago, we published this paper some years ago, um, but you're gonna see that the survival rate of these implants is not that perfect. So you have, after five years time, um, less than 40% implant survival. However, we were able to keep the leg in most of the patients 
but if you look at the um, complications, we faced a lot of complications in these patients more than in a normal distal femur replacement. So a periprostatic infection in 22 of these patients, which was around about um, more than 40%. And this was an awful result. The, the um, function results are not too bad, but to be honest, uh, when I may need to do this decision, I always talk to the patient, maybe it's better to do an, just a, an, an amputation um, because in the long run, the function results are better in these patients. However, if they refuse an amputation, then you can try it. Um, it's not too bad from a functional point of view, but it's not perfect anyway. So um, another point is um, what I just mentioned before is um, we deal with infants, we deal with a growing skeleton. And if you have distal femur or proximal tibia tumor, in most of the cases, you need to sacrifice at least one physis. And um, this is something where we have to deal with it because um, if you treat a patient with the age of five or six years, and he has around about 10 years of rest growth, and you have a growth of around about two centimeters around the knee joint every year. Um, so this makes up to 20% of leg length discrepancy. And this is not easy to handle if you don't do anything about just like doing um, using, for example, expandable implants or using custom-made implants or a combination of both to deal with the small anatomy in the very young ones and to try to lengthen the leg. This is something, as I told before, I would just recommend for patients below the age of five, um, um, uh, so, uh, with the age of five or older, and below the age of five, um, for example, for this young one, uh, young one year old um, boy, I, I wouldn't go for an endoprosthetic replacement because you would face too many revision surgeries um, during um, the course of skeletal matru maturity. Um, so um, in these patients, I tend to do some, for example, this rotation plasty like we did in this very young one, um, because I, I don't really believe that if tumor endoprosthesis in these patients is, is, really, is really helpful in the long run. Okay, so they're not doing too bad, but if, if the patient is older or the patients are older, then I like to use these non-invasive um, distal femur replacements, growing prosthesis. Um, they are doing uh, at least a good job. You can lengthen the implant depending on the reconstruction length, um, which is somehow between five and seven centimeters in um, one step, at least in, in one millimeter steps per day. And um, as you can see in this X-ray, we lengthen the implant around about seven centimeters in this patient, and then you can level out the leg length um, and, and balance the, the leg length in these patients. And this works quite nicely. Um, another um, idea or another technique is using these um, bioexpanded implants. So there is um, um, at least it's a distal femur tumor anaprosthesis, which is uh, connected to a growing nail. And then you start some lengthening over the nail procedure. Um, the advantage is you, 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 you have a good, you, you make it, the ratio between implant and bone is getting better by, by extending the bone um, by this lengthening procedure. Um, but the problem in these is sometimes that you can't stop the lengthening procedure. Um, so you have to lengthen um, at least the full length of the, of the implant or the nail because you can't stop it during the lengthening procedure because then you get a consolidation of the bone and then you need to get in back in, in a second surgery and make a new osteotomy if you, if you stop it with in between. But it works out nicely. So we did a couple of these patients and they are not doing that badly. So I think um, expanded venal prosthesis are not longer an experimental um, uh, technique or surgery. Um, so there's a nice multi-center study published um, some recently um, with around about 107 patients. They, they used the Stanmore implant, non-invasive expandable distal femur in this uh, case. And they had, um, I think, acceptable rates of complications. They faced seven infections, um, but they had an implant survival of 66% after five years and 48 after 10 years. Um, so this was not too bad, and they were able to lengthen most of the implants without that much um, technical complications. So, but now let's come to, to, to the complications we face using anaprosthesis in the distal part or around the knee joint. 
in tumor patients. There was um, published in 2018 this paper, Chinese paper, that summarized some of the results um, with patients, with oncological patients treated with distafema and proximate tibia and a prosthetic replacement. And what you can see is that um, the overall survival of these implants is not too bad. You can't compare these with primary arthroplasty, of course. Um, as I told you, these are oncological patients, and this is a little bit more difficult. But however, the five-year survival rate of the implants is, in average, around about 75%, which is not too bad, I would say. Um, the MSDS score, which is, um, which is the kind of functional score, was not too bad. So 100% is perfect and it's around about 80, 85% in average, which is good also. And then you look at the rate or at the, the cause of complication, and the main problem is infection, infection, infection. As uh, Dr. Feitas uh, stated in his, in his um, presentation, it's the most serious complication, but we also face some aseptic loosenings of the stems of the implants, and of course, some mechanical failures um, and this is most often in the knee joint, um, aware of the bushing. Um, and this is something you can't really avoid in the long run just by improving the implants. And then there's the second study I'd just like to present you um, of, of a very long um, follow-up patients. Um, so this is a study from the Birmingham group. They had um, patients with minimum of 25 years after primary surgery. It's not just the um, tumors around the knee joint, they, they included the humerus and some more, but however, you're gonna see 200 patients were eligible um, after 25 years from 564. So you nearly lose 60% of the patients in the long run because they die um, because of the disease or at, with, because of other causes. But um, you're gonna see, and this is what I wanted to point out is you had, they had 610 further operations. This was just around 2.1, 2.7 um, operation per patient in the 25 years as revision procedures. And there you're gonna see some of the patients had even around about 10 um, revision procedures in, in their clinical course. So the risk of amputation, in particular for the lower extremity, because there was no amputation in the upper extremity was about 16% at 30 years. Um, but so you're gonna see most of the extremities can be um, salvaged. Um, the proximate tibia had the highest risk of infection, which was around about 43%, which is a lot. And um, the risk of infection was around about 2.7% for every revision procedure, which is not that low. Um, and they stated out also that the risk of infection in, for every patient is around about 1% per year. And this is um, something we have to keep in mind. Um, the most common reason, or even in this, um, and also in this paper, was um, aseptic loosening, um, was rebushing of the of the um, of the knee joint mechanism, and it was infection. However, functional result was good, as I pointed out in the on the slides before, um, and the survival of the um, of the leg was or the extremity was not too bad. Also, so around about eighty percent, eighty five percent after more than twenty five years. So what um, was the main problem in this paper was aseptic loosening. This was the ma main cause for, for revision. And there's always the question what to do. How should we fix the um, implants into the bone? I, I also I told you before, I like to do um, some uncemented stem fixation. I think if you get a good press fit, then you get very, very few problems with loosening. Um, in the cemented ones, it's always a question, how long do they last? There are several papers presenting some good rates um, on, on, um, on cemented stems. Um, this is just a study from the um, colleagues from the Netherlands. They showed that using um, proximal tiba and distifemur in the prosthesis, um, the patients with a cemented stem did far better in terms of um, not, not, not facing the complication of aseptic loosening and the cemented ones were not that good as the cement less fixation. So this is something I, I would say, I, I, it's, I don't think it's too bad. So it's my impression also, but of course there are some changes in the, in the, in the prosthetic designs over the last couple of years. And um, even for the ones they like to use cemented stems, um, there are new implants with this hydroxyapatite cola, which seem to be 
um, beneficial in terms of reducing the risk of aseptic loosening. It's around about 7% in these um, studies. Um, we just look at our data, it's less than 5% using mostly um, the cementless stem. So um, I think this is not this big issue anymore in endoprosthetic replacements, but as we heard before, infection remains the most serious complication and is the most um, um, prominent and common reason for secondary amputation in dealing with these patients. We've heard if you have poo somewhere an infection, you need to revise it, you make a good debridement, you need to put out all the hardware and all the metal and make a good um, two-stage revision. So we published these data and we did some research on the silver coating um, before in the last couple of years. We published this data in approximate, for, for patients with proximate tibia replacements. Um, these were around about 100 patients, although just 56 patients were in the silver group, so in the treatment group. And what we did see is that we were able in these patients to reduce the risk of infection um, as the primary infection, but also in, in case of uh, secondary infection rates, um, nearly half of the rate of infection in these patients. And what was important is that we were able to reduce the rate of secondary amputation due to infection um, significantly and nearly um, more than half and this rate. So I know these groups are not that large and this is a problem dealing with tumor patients is always that the numbers of these patients are pretty small. And then it's always the question how to do a proper study, how to do a good prospective study to really improve or to really show whether there's an effect on the silver coating um, in terms of prophylaxis or in terms of infection reduction. And this was a nice paper published this year. Um, they, sh they looked at the, the quality of the papers dealing with this um, question. And if you, you're gonna see, there are two of our papers, one and the, this the other one, and, and green is good. So this is a good study, red is not that good um, because there is a huge bias in, in the one or the other term. And um, you're gonna see no, there's no study where just, just green spots. And um, this means um, because of the small number of patients, it's always difficult to make good conclusions. But however, what you can see is that most of these studies show some effect, um, at least a trend towards the effect of silver coating in terms of reducing um, infection rate. And this is something I really believe on, not just in terms of um, in, in, in patients with um, revision cases, but I really think that silver might is, is able to um, reduce um, infection rates, even in primary cases and, and um, doing an effect, is effective to um, as a prophylaxis. So one last thing I just want to point out is new, it's a new trend and a new technological development in tumor and prosthetic replacements. And this is the 3D printing technology. Um, this is something which is very good because you can adapt with these implants very good to small anatomy. You can adapt to remnant bone stock by using these implants. This is CT based. Um, and then this is a highly porous uh, titanium structure. And this is something which heals perfectly into the bone. And um, this is something where we are able in the last three, four years to um, spare knee joints. So the best thing you can do is to keep the joint whenever possible and not replacing the joint. And this is something, um, just an example of one of my patients with a proximal femur replacement, but you can see this is just a stem with a length of just 2.5 centimeters. So this is very, very short. And some years ago, I wouldn't be able to preserve this knee joint. So I would have done the total femur in this case, but um, using this technology, we were able to have a good stability. So this guy has full weight bearing. Um, we were able to preserve the physis and we were able to preserve the knee joint, which is always good to have. Um, two other examples um, for this um, type of procedures. So this is a 15 year old female with an adamantinoma. And you're gonna see there's a, it's, it's very close to the joint. You need some good margins, at least, I like to have two centimeters to the tumor of a safe margin within the bone. And um, we did a resection of this and then we implanted this one. And again, some years ago, I wouldn't be able to, to preserve the knee joint because we didn't have these stems or at least this, this type of stem, the small 
um, custom made stem, um, but now she's doing good. So these are the post-op images. Um, I did the surgery three months ago. I just saw her back um, in, in, in my ambulatory and she's doing fine, has full weight bearing. So this is, I think, a good example of um, not sacrificing the bone um, uh, or the joint if, if it's not uh, necessary. Another, and my last example is this 19 year old female with an osteosarcoma. You're gonna see it's a huge tumor um, within the soft tissues with an extension in the, within the femur. And again, um, I wasn't sure with my, at the first, I wasn't sure how she responded to near advent chemotherapy. Um, we did a resection. I just want to confirm that I have clear margins before I do a good reconstruction because otherwise, when if the margins were contaminated, we had to discuss about an amputation. Um, but good luck, margins were free. Um, she responded quite nicely to chemotherapy. And then we did this kind of reconstruction again, um, sparing or preserving the knee and the hip joint using these um, printed implants. And this is um, the second um, one is um, around about eight months down the line. So she's, she's, she has full weight bearing and she has very few complaints. So um, let me summarize. Um, I think there are good overall rates of extremity survival dealing with patients or with tumors around the knee joint. Um, the tibia is more complicated than it is the femur. Um, we, although we have to keep in mind that we have high revision rate of revision procedures in the long run, infection still remains the most serious complication. Growing implants are no longer um, experimental. I think they do a good job. And this new 3D printing technology might improve our results even um, in the future. And maybe we, we are going to do better than in the past. So thank you very much from Germany, Essen. So it's somewhere in between, in the middle of Europe. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Arndt. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask you, Dr. João Paulo or Dr. Edgar if they have uh, questions for Dr. Arndt. Yeah. Bom, primeiro eu queria agradecer, Dr. Stratburger, uma, uma aula muito interessante. Dr. Stratburger, muito inter uh, mm. very interesting your uh, presentation in. Eu gostaria de saber and I'd like to know, I'd like to ask you a question in relation to the expandable implants or the extendable endoprosthesis. What are the situation around these expandable implants? How do you see the results? What are the changes that have to be made in order to be a more effective procedure? He wants to know about expandable implants. Yeah, I hope you're going to hear me. So yeah, thanks for this question. So um, this is a fear that is not that easy. So um, the, the problem with these growing implants is always that you have to, you have to um, do at least two more revision surgeries. So what we, we know that around about uh, Forty percent of these patients die. So if we do so, and, and these implants are, are really cost intensive. So if we put in this implant, primarily at least the motor, in Germany it costs around right about fifteen to twenty thousand euros. The motor at just the motor and not the, the implant. So this doubles the price of the implant. And then some of these patients die. So they there's no need for these to to elongate the leg because um, the, the the leg discrepancy just comes up later after years after primary surgery. Um, so my philosophy is to, to go in for a second surgery if there is a lack discrepancy in these patients. And then I like to lengthen um, at least in, in a, in, somehow in a one step procedure. So one millimeter per day um, or the five centimeters. Sometimes I over lengthen the leg just knowing that the other one will grow um, later on. And, and this is something, so then you have two surgery and then so at the end of the growth, you need to change the implant again and put in um, a, a final implant. So you have two more additional surgeries. And this is something I would just do for patients where I expect a leg discrepancy of more than three to four centimeters. If, if it's just one or two centimeters, I wouldn't go for it because you always have the risk of infection. That's the main complication problem. Yeah. 
Muito obrigado pela resposta. Thank é, you so much for your answer, Ricardo, Dr. Você... Arn. Yeah. Ricardo, would you like to ask something? Uh, Ricardo, can, can, can I ask yeah. a, a question to Professor Arn? You said uh, you usually use the non cemented stamp, but uh, yeah. even uh, in the oldest uh, submitted to radiotherapy, because this was on that patient, I have the biggest problems with the loosening. Uh, and from the stem in the femur around the knee, uh, that's a big deal for me. And I usually use for uh, for the beginning the cemented one and i try to reduce the extent of the cement inside mm -hmm. the bone mm -hmm. for the future if i need to revise them but for them i usually use the cemented one i try the youngest to use the non-cemented you are right. uh, you are for sure you are right but uh, in the oldest submitted to radiotherapy and in our field There is always radiotherapy almost the times. That's a big problem for me because it interferes with the growth of the bone yeah. Yeah. to do yeah. a secondary fixation of the stem. Yeah, yeah I, I, I absolutely agree to you. So it's, it's always the question. So maybe it's, it's the school you grew up. So I, mm -hmm. I, I grew up with using mostly non-cemented stems and yeah. I, the results are good, but um, obviously, The results are not worse using cemented stems, of course. So if you look at the, the literature, so there are a lot of, lot of studies presenting very similar rates in terms yeah. of aseptic loosening. So I think it's not that big deal. But as you said, I think it's always difficult if you have an infection and you have to remove all the cement. And yeah, you this, are is, right. this is a bigger issue in contrast if you have um, in comparison to, to um, a non-cement. It's easier stem. to take out yeah. the, the stem, to take of out. course, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, Okay. But but if you do if you do a good planning, if you good feeding during surgery and make a good press fit, then my my experience is I like the cementless stems. But even in the, even in the youngest professor, um, yeah. I have some cases of the loosening because of the okay the chemo interferes with the growthing yeah. of the bone yeah. and yeah. the radio in in that side there a big deal. But yeah, okay, you are right with a good press fit. You guarantee we have a good mechanical outcome and a okay. safe one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Arn, we've got a, a question from Dr. Marcelo uh, from Brazil. Uh, he is asking uh, which company is providing this uh, 3D borrowed coated implant for you? Yeah, that, I think most of the companies provide at the moment some some kind of 3d printing so i we work together with the implant cast companies since a couple of years and so i i get my implants from the implant cast company yeah. and is this is this short this very short stems custom made prosthesis you presented so yeah. are, are them from from implant cast yeah yeah they are they are so you, yeah, they are avail yeah. Uh, so so you, are, are, are they available in the market No, yeah, actually, no, they, they're individual implants. So, mm -hmm. um, so you need, so this is something you, you need, you need with whatever company that provides your implants. I think most of them are, are at the moment able to provide some, some 3D printing implants. So this is, you need, you need to, to, um, to make a good planning. So you need a CT scan in one millimeter steps from the patient, from the bone, and you need additional in the MRI just to um, estimate and measure your, your oncological mm -hmm. margins and your, and your osteotomy. And then you, you send these images to the company and then they make you some, some, um, some trials and then you, you have to, to, to be in contact with the company, with the engineers, just um, to, um, to finally present um, a planning where you are satisfied and the company is satisfied and then they, they put it into the, the 3D printer and then you get the implant around about six weeks later. Uh, Professor Ryan, can I ask one question? Do you have CT scan during the surgery? Because to, for yeah. the custom mates, um, the big problem for me is to cut exactly yeah. in the yeah. right place to use yeah. the custom mate. Yeah. And um, to do that here in Portugal, I don't have the CT scan. So I cut, I perform a spacer, and then 
uh, I, I, pro I do the procedure with the, yeah. the reconstruction. Yeah. And that's a big deal for me because I need to wait a lot right. Right. to have the custom made prosthesis. Right. Yeah, actually, we wait um, for several weeks to have from, several, from the start of the, from the planning of, of the of the implant okay. to the to the final to the final stem. But um, it, it's a procedure of six to eight weeks, even six, even six to eight, six to eight weeks. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I, as I presented, we did some cases where this was too much time. So we did um, implantation of a cement spacer first, and then we made um, made the planning yes, um, and put the in the implant. Yeah, absolutely. So it's yeah, you, you don't get it faster, but we have a 3D uh, scan during surgery. That's that's a good help, and that's a otherwise, good thing. You, yeah, yeah. you might you might use some jigs. That's uh, I need I need to option. go to be with you to see that because that's <laughs> one thing I want here in Portugal. I yeah. know it's expensive and it's a big deal yeah. here. Yeah, I demand that in my to my hospital. But yeah, they say they, it's expensive. It's expensive. I know. Yeah, it's expensive, but it, and it takes time, and it takes time. Okay, That's a problem. Thanks, you lose, professor. you lose half an hour. You lose half an hour surgery time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> so, Edgar, any more questions? Any anything else? Uh, yes, I would like to to ask you, Dr. Stratberger, if these three D uh, printed uh, implants uh, are they of solid metal or are they always porous? This uh, and the more uh, percentage of the implant is by this open porous structure, um, the weaker the implant is. And so the engineers always say, okay, so we need to make somehow, uh, um, we need to balance that out. So some parts are solid and the other parts are open structure or open porous structure. And, and this is something you, you need to discuss with the, with the um, company. So I like to have an open porous structure um, at, at the contact to the bone at that side, at the surfaces which have contact to the bone. Um, if the other parts are not open structures, so I think I don't, I don't really care about that. Can you control this ingrowth? Sorry? After surgery, can you control if there are, the ingrowth is happening or not? No, you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, no, no, scan no. and then you can see yeah. it. No, no, unfortunately, not really. So I, I, I would say if it's stable, if it's not getting loose, so there must be somehow an ingrowth. I did a revision in at least one case, um, and there was a perfect ingrowth of the bone in, into this open structure. This was pretty, this was perfect. So this was so strong. Um, and this was the, just the one case I, I did a revision. And so this is one experience. And the other are just clinical experiences. So the patients have full weight bearing, have no complaints. So I would say it it should be it should be um, stable. It works. Okay. Yeah. Thank you but very there's, much. But there's no there's no no diagnostic to it. No, unfortunately not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This is this is the real life. So uh, any any more questions, uh, Dr. Jean Paulo, Dr. Edgar, oh, from the audience? Okay. No. So well, we're we're a little bit no. late, but okay. No, no. It's been so so interesting in discussion that. Yeah. Uh, Time, time really flies. Uh, so uh, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Brazilian Association of Orthopedic Oncology uh, to all our participants here and the availability on a Saturday. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon in the other events. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you, people. Thank you for you all and obrigado. <laughs> thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye to you all. Thank you. <laughs> See you right. on the next congresses, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah, in Gramado. It's Hopefully. A good idea. Keep our fingers crossed, huh? <laughs> in Vienna. In Vienna. Yeah, Graz. Graz, 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 Graz yes. Graz. Graz. Yeah. Is everything okay, I hope. <laughs> yeah. They just, 